Welcome to Anchors of Truth from the 3ABN Worship Center. Decoding Apocalyptic Prophecy with James Rafferty. Good morning and welcome. And uh, we'd like to welcome all of our friends around the world as well as those of you here that come locally and some of you have traveled a while to be here. Thank you for joining us for Anchors of Truth. How many have been blessed by Brother James Rafferty already? Okay, a lot of you. If we could see the hands of those at home, I have a feeling there'd be thousands and maybe hundreds of thousands. And I was talking to him a little bit before we came out here and I asked him, how long have you been coming back to 3A? Ben? It's been about 20 years. I heard of him before that. I heard about these two young men. It seemed like they were barely 20 years old that had a burden for the gospel and were on fire for Jesus and began to preach all around. And they've been coming here, Ty uh, Gibson, James Rafferty, for a long time. And today, welcome to Anchors of Truth. And uh, I, I was thinking about the gospel of Jesus Christ today. The, the topic is on Babylon. And as Christians, we're commissioned to go tell the world, right? We're not supposed to have a secret society. There's all these secret societies around the world. But we don't have a secret society, do we? Jesus says, go ye into all the world, preach the gospel to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. They ask a government leader sometime, I forgot who, who it was, and I remember hearing this. They ask him, what do you do? They heard he had this job that's pretty secret. He said, what do you do? And he said, well, to tell you the truth, my job is so secretive, I, can't, I'm, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> Hello, somebody get that? Our job's so secretive, he doesn't even know what he's doing. Well, that's not the way it is with Christians, is it? Our job, God has said, go ye into all the world. The greatest asset that we have is our own personal testimony of what God has done for us. So I encourage each and every one of you today, those of you watching at home from around the world, listening by radio. I have to say that Jay Christian's here, so I want to make sure I put in radio, Jay. Uh, radio, Internet, however you're watching 3ABN, listening to 3ABN to develop a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing like it. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. We live in, in turbulent times, but right now we can have a great peace in the midst of the storm. What I'd like to do is I'd like to uh, say a little prayer. We're in, um, inviting, we've already done so here, the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon this program, and then we're going to have Dr. Yvonne Lewis and uh, Dr. Von Lewis is going to be doing some music. But let's bow our heads together right now. Father, we thank you for this another beautiful Sabbath day that you've given us to worship you. We thank you for life and health and strength. We thank you for the opportunity of being here today. We invite your Holy Spirit to be in our midst to rule and reign, that you would give Brother James Rafferty words of wisdom from on high. Lord, we thank you for light bearers, for what they have been doing millions and millions of pamphlets and brochures and booklets giving your gospel message into all the world and personally traveling around the world preaching and teaching others about you and your soon coming we pray for anointing upon james upon his ministry upon ty upon their families today protective hedge about them as they endeavor to take this gospel into all the world thank you for this anchors of truth series that we can continually put out good news to a lost and dying world. These things we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to invite Dr. Yvonne Lewis. Uh, she's going to be singing a beautiful song, He Still Leads. And right after this, uh, the next voice you'll hear will be Brother James Rafferty. I 
trust in him though I can't see for he Thank you, Yvonne. That has been the theme of our series all through this week, hasn't it? He leadeth me. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. So the whole idea is that we need to find Jesus. And of course, we're in the book of Revelation, so it's vital for us to find Jesus there because that can be a very scary place without Jesus. A lot of us have gone there without Jesus. A lot of people have gone to the book of Revelation without Jesus. But we've decided that we're going to turn around and go back to Revelation chapter 1, find Jesus before we venture into the rest of the book. And that's what we've been doing night by night. We've been looking for Jesus so that we can identify and understand the rest of the book of Revelation. This morning we're going to be talking about Babylon. And this topic is no exception to the foundation that we've laid, the principle that we've laid in looking for Jesus first. The only way that we can really identify Babylon is if we find Jesus. The only way that Babylon can even be felled in our lives, that is, 
destroyed, terminated, decimated, is when we come in contact with Jesus Christ who is the everlasting gospel. Revelation chapter 14 makes this very, very clear. If you want to open your Bibles there this morning to Revelation 14, we talked about this a little bit last night, but for those of you who were <clears throat> playing hooky, we'll review. I know you weren't really. You were all watching at home, right? Yes. Good. So you know what we're going to say right here. You know what it is, the point that we're going to make, and that is that Revelation 14 gives us an outline of the steps that we are to take as we proclaim the everlasting gospel. The outline being this, Revelation 14, 6, I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. The gospel comes first. The gospel comes first. Jesus first. Now the second... Uh, first angel may say to the second angel, you go ahead and you go first. I'm a gentleman. I'll let you go first. But the second angel insists, no, 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 no. I cannot go before you. Because my announcement is Babylon is fallen. And there is no way that Babylon can completely fall unless you proclaim the gospel with a loud voice. Babylon is identified in many ways, probably more ways than we can even articulate today. It is so intricately involved and intertwined in everything we do. In fact, Revelation chapter 18 identifies Babylon as this world and everything in this world. That there is no way that we could have enough time to go through all of the symbols and facts that identify Babylon in our lives. That is why the Word of God tells us focus on the gospel. The more you become familiar with the gospel of Jesus Christ, the more clearly Babylon will be identified and destroyed. Keep your focus on Jesus. And you will find Babylon is not only out there in some other denomination or in some worldly enterprise, but Babylon is the very core center of the human heart. Amen. And you will find that the only thing that can help us on that level is Jesus. Babylon, I think, can be defined in many ways. One of the best ways that I define it is in the original language, and that is confusion. That's also taken from the Tower of Babel. Confusion concerning the gospel, the everlasting gospel. Confusion, confusion concerning religion. You see it in the context of the message itself. Babylon is confusion. Many times my wife and I will get into a little bit of confusion. She tells me I'm losing my hearing. I think it might be selective. I don't know. But the fact of the matter is there are times when she will tell me something and I will not hear her and I will be confused. <laughs> Babylon represents confusion concerning what we are hearing about God and the gospel, about salvation. Notice what it says here in this context, verse 8, another angel followed saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen that great city because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Wine in the Bible represents, well, primarily it represents the blood of Jesus Christ. This is the wine of my blood. It's the gospel. It's salvation. But there's fornication that's being mingled here, fornicating wine here in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 8. Babylon has mingled salvation with other things. And there's confusion about salvation in relation to Babylon and what it's teaching. There's a lot of religious confusion in the world today. And I could stand here all morning and try to give you examples of that religious confusion. But it would not help us for two reasons. One, it would only cause us to look at those examples as Babylon and miss Babylon in our own hearts. Two, it would fall short of a complete picture. Therefore, even though we're talking about Babylon, we're actually talking about the everlasting gospel. Because the only way we can identify Babylon is to lift up Jesus and lift up the everlasting gospel. So really, this morning's meeting is the everlasting gospel part two. Surprise. <laughs> Jesus tells us that this Babylon is going to fall. Now that word fall means to come to an end. This Babylon is going to fall when the gospel is preached. Look in Matthew chapter 24. This is one of those prophetic chapters 
found in the Synoptic Gospels. Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21 are all prophetic chapters. They all parallel the book of Revelation as well as the book of Daniel. Matthew 24, Jesus talks about all these signs that are going to take place before his return. And we are familiar with a lot of them. There's going to be wars and rumors of wars. Yes, there are wars and rumors of wars. There's going to be earthquakes, natural disasters in different places. There's going to be famine and pestilence. We see all of this taking place today. It's been taking place for many, many years. Jesus says it was going to escalate like a woman in birth pains. I know how that is. I remember when my wife gave birth to our daughter specifically. Our son was, well, his labor was about 31 hours. He was born first. He was our firstborn. Our daughter, well, we thought it would be at least half that time, but, well, she was born from the time my wife started having birth pains until she was delivered, two hours and about 15 minutes. Problem was, we were about an hour and a half from the hospital. It was January, midwinter, and we didn't leave until about an hour before she was born because we thought we had time. So my wife was in the back seat having birth pains, (laughs) and I was driving. (laughs) I was having my own kind of pains. And those pains got more intense and more frequent until finally my wife said, pull over, I'm having this baby here. And I looked around and I said, I'm not pulling over, we're almost there, we're almost there, we're almost there. I was hyperventilating by the time I got to the hospital, my knuckles, my hands were like this in, in steering wheel position. I pulled them off the steering wheel and went and hammered on the door of the hospital. They wouldn't let me in until they got a call identifying who I was and who was in the car with me. Our daughter was born five minutes after we got there. (laughs) Birth pains increased with intensity and frequency until finally something is delivered. In this case, the something is going to be a uniting of all nations to afflict God's people for God's name's sake. Matthew 25, 4 and verse 9. In that context, when all the nations hate you because you love Jesus... When all the nations unite together to do something about the calamities, the the global warming and the natural disasters and the wars and the famines and the pestilence, when all nations come together to do something about that and you stick out like a sore thumb because you know the answer isn't in what we can do but what He can do, not what we can solve but what He can solve, that you're pointing to Jesus rather than to people and politics then people aren't going to like you very much. They're going to think you're against the movement, you're against the the unity, and you're going to be hated. In that climate, the gospel is going to be preached as a witness. That's what Jesus says in verse 14 in Matthew 24. He says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to all the world for a witness unto all nations. That word, original martyr, martyrdom. We're not going to love our lives unto death. We talked about that last night. In Revelation 12, verse 11, only God can give us that kind of love, that self-sacrificing love that was manifest in the heart and life of Jesus Christ. It comes as we see God's love for us. And it says that then, verse 14, the end will come. The end of what? The end of Babylon. The end of this world. Revelation chapter 18, it's going to fall, it's going to fall, it's going to fall. Why? Look in Revelation chapter 18, you're going to see the very same thing. And I want you to think about what the key element is in each one of these verses that we've looked at. Matthew 24, there's a key point there. Revelation 14, there's a key point there. Revelation 18, there's a key point there. Revelation 18, beginning with verse 1. Are you with me? Trying to keep you awake this morning. I know there's a lot of flu and sickness going around. I know you've been in bed all week, some of you, fighting that sickness and flu. But it's time to wake up. We're in the Word this morning. Praise God for His Word. It's powerful. It is able to wake us up. After these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with His glory. Whose glory is that? It's the glory of God, and the glory of God is the everlasting gospel. The gospel is lightening the earth with the glory of God. The gospel is illuminating the minds and hearts of the entire world population. That's the same thing we see taking place in Matthew 24. This gospel will go as a witness to all nations. The same thing we see happening in Revelation chapter 14. The everlasting gospel preached to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. In the context context of that, as a consequence of that, Babylon falls. Notice what it says here in Revelation chapter 18, verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, 
Well, I've gone a little bit too far here. Verse 2, And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. Now, I, I like the way that is termed there in Revelation 18, verse 2. It says, Babylon the what? The great. And if you don't know that, it's time to wake up and smell the roses. Babylon is great in this sense, that it is taking a hold of and seeking to crush the life out of every one of us individually in the church corporately it is a great insurmountable power that inundates our lives and our hearts but guess what God can bring it down God can bring it down how's he going to do that well it's going to be the gospel and it's going to be preached Revelation 14 with a loud voice praise God for the gospel Praise God for Jesus. Notice what it says here. I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Verse 7, same with a loud voice. That's what my wife has to do sometimes. I'm just not hearing well, and so she'll have to t say it with a loud voice. And then I get it. It's clear. Loud doesn't mean yelling. It just means that it's clear. The gospel is clear. So what is the gospel clearly saying to us? Well, the gospel, in essence, is a revelation of God's unconditional love. There are people, Christian people, who are confused about God's unconditional love. They think that God loves a certain group of us, namely believers, that God has given his life for a certain group of us, namely for those who have responded to that, that God is the savior of a certain group of us, that God has given faith to a certain group of us. But I don't find a text in the Bible that says, for God so loved Christians that he gave his only begotten son. Or that God so loved Baptists or Adventists that he gave his only begotten son. The verse that I'm thinking of in John chapter 3 and verse 16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Well, there's a clear declaration of the gospel. God loves the world so that whosoever believes in him. God has not predestined certain people to be, to be saved and certain people to be lost. Which, by the way, addition to that means, in some people's minds, burn in hell forever. God has predestined certain people to burn in hell forever. See, that confusion about God is going to be decimated by the everlasting gospel. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The whole world is included in this unconditional love. Jesus Christ, well, let's just take a look at the verses here. The next one is found in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10. Jesus Christ wants the world to know about his love for every single person. Jesus Christ wants the world to know, 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10. Are you with me? You there? I'll give you as much time as you need. No, just kidding. <laughs> For therefore we both labor and we suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all, all men and especially of those that believe. <laughs> There are two categories there, friends. And this has to be in the context of John 3.16. John 3.16 interprets 1 Timothy 4.10. God is the Savior of everyone, and especially in an eternal sense of those who believe. There will be people who will be lost, who will not be saved eternally. It's not because God doesn't love them. It's not because God is not their Savior. Are we together this morning? The everlasting gospel dispels predestination. Not in a biblical sense, because God has predestined everyone to be saved. God is long-suffering us with 2 Peter 3, 9. He doesn't want anyone to be lost. And therefore, He has given Romans 12, 3, everyone a measure of faith. Everyone. Jesus is the author, and He is the finisher of faith. And He hasn't left everyone out. There isn't a long line of people coming to Jesus and He's doling out faith and He's doling out faith and those that get there first get the most faith and those who are in the back of the line, I'm sorry, I've run out of faith. No. He's the man that took the loaves and the fishes and fed the multitudes and there was still baskets left over. 
There is plenty for everyone. Revelation does not picture Jesus staying at the pearly gates saying 143,998, 143,999. Quick, quick, last one, quick. You jump, 144,000. Okay, that's it. That's it. Sorry, Angie. <laughs> no, no, no. The 144,000 is a symbolic number of the redeemed. It represents those who are saved. If you want to see what they look like and not hear, you need to look at the great multitude that no man can number. Of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. God has, in His Word, made it very clear that His grace comes to all. Look at Titus chapter 2. Titus is right after Timothy. So if you're in Timothy, you just throw, over, throw those pages over, just a couple pages over, and you're going to come to Titus chapter 2 and verse 11. Titus 2 and verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to... Yeah, not just to the Christians, not just to the believers. It's appeared to all men. We are surrounded with an atmosphere of grace. Take a deep breath. That helps me to relax, actually. <laughs> that breath cost God everything He has. And He gave it as an evidence of His unconditional love for every human being. That's what the Bible teaches. Look at it. It's in Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. Let's move there together. We're talking about Babylon again. Babylon's coming down. It's coming down. It's coming down. As the gospel is preached, the confusion about God, the confusion about salvation is being decimated. God's character is being uplifted. He loves us. He doesn't just love you. He loves all of you. Continue out into the world. Babylon is is a symbol not only of religious confusion but of the confusion that's in the world. There are people in the world that have a wrong picture of God and therefore they refuse to have anything to do with religion. And God says, I love them. I love those people in Babylon in that confusion. I love them because the religion they hate is the religion I hate. The, the ideas that they hate of, of a God that would, would torture people in fire and brimstone for a million, a billion, a trillion, a gogillion years is the same picture I hate. And there are a lot of atheists that hate that picture and they want nothing to do with a God like that. Well, I don't either and neither does God. So God says, I've got people in Babylon, I've got people in confusion and I want them out of it because they think the way I think. They actually know me even though I've been masked by this religion, religious confusion, by this fornication, this mixture of truth and error that Babylon is, that is the essence of Babylon. God says in, in Acts chapter 17, beautiful here, how Paul is preaching to the world in his time, to Babylon in his time, to those who are confused in his time. He says, and I'm going to start in the context of verse 24, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwells not in temples made with hands, Neither is he worshipped with man's hands as though he needed anything, seeing that he gives to all, what? Life and breath and all things. Everything that anyone has is from God. And he is made of one blood, all nations of men. Verse 26, that's right, we're all related. So there goes racism. Just went right down the toilet. Good place for it to go. He has made of one blood all nations of men to dwell on the, all the face of the earth and has determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. God knows where you live. He has every hair on your head counted and numbered. Amen. That's not about hair. That's about care. I stopped caring about the numbers of hairs on my head a long time ago. <laughs> and I know some of you did too. It's like, okay, they're in the sink now. God knows. Not a sparrow falls, but He knows. He knows the heartache that you're feeling. He knows the struggles you're going through. He knows how lonely you feel. He knows how, how strong your passion is and how overwhelmed you feel when you're taking that test or 
when you're interacting with other people or when you're working or when you're struggling with those inner thoughts that you know are not in harmony with who he is. He knows. He's with you in that. He's not against you. He doesn't hate you. He loves you. He empathizes. He sympathizes. He is your friend, not your enemy. And like no other being in the universe, he is for you. He's got your back and your front and everything around you. He surrounds you with life. That's why verse 27, that they should seek the Lord and and if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he's not far from every one of us. For in him, in him, in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said. For we are also his offspring. We are in Jesus Christ. In a very real and tangible way, the entire world is in Christ. Now it's a temporal way. It's not an eternal way. Not everyone in the world has decided for Christ. But the only way that that can decision can be made is if we're in him, in a temporal way, at least. We've got to at least have temporal life. You understand what I mean by temporal life? Temporal life, this life. This life is temporary, temporal life. If we're going to have eternal life, we've got to have temporal life. Because this life gives us the opportunity, the opportunity for eternity to make a choice. But friends, listen closely. This temporal life cost God everything. Everything. The cross did not just give us eternal life. It gave us temporary life. Without the cross, we wouldn't have temporary life. Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. And we should have died a long time ago. But Jesus stepped in in our place. And he took our penalty so we could have temporal life. And God is saying to us, you know what? I would really love it if the life you have now would never end. I'd like to kind of have you just hang out with me for all eternity. Not me. You don't like, I love you. you, you really you love? You? Yes. There's a few things I'd like to see change. But I think you would too. As you see more of me, I think you're going to see that selfishness isn't the best for you or anyone else. But I'd like your life just to continue on, just to continue on for all eternity. Sometimes people say to me, well, I don't think I want to live for eternity. I mean, you know, life is bad enough for just the three score and ten. Who wants to live for eternity? Well, think, 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 think for a second. Not about the trials you're going through now, not about the way you feel health-wise now, but think back to a time. I don't know when it was in your life, I know when it was in mine. It might just have been a moment of time, a few days, weeks. It might have been just an hour or a minute. But just think back to a time in your life when you were truly happy, all out, no holes barred, happy. I mean, you were so happy that nothing could touch you happy. I mean, you were just like floating on a cloud. It was just like, wow. Think about that, that time when you were really happy. And imagine what it would be like to be in that moment of time for all eternity. Amen. To feel that way for all eternity. Because that's what eternal life is. It's joy and peace and happiness without end. It's not just a place. It's an experience that God wants you to have. And even though there's evil and pain and sorrow and suffering and sin in this world that interrupts that experience perhaps in, for some of us more than we have the experience we have interruptions to that experience as long as we have that experience even for a few moments we have an earnest if you will a down payment of what God really wants for us of what eternal life really is going to be all about and so God gives us this taste unconditionally he wants us to know unconditionally how he feels about us he is the savior of all Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9 says Jesus Christ has tasted death for all not just for a few but for all and one of the reasons why 3ABN is here why this program even exists is found in John chapter 1 and verse 9 we're talking here about the unconditional manifestations of the everlasting gospel. 
that is going to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, that dispels the darkness, that diminishes the, the confusion that decimates Babylon, that brings it down. John chapter 1 and verse 9 it's talking about Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, coming to this world and dwelling among us. And it says in verse 9 that that was the true light. Are you there with me? And that true light lightens. What does it lighten? Every man. Oh, every man that comes into the world. God gives light to all. He gives life to all. He gives faith to all. He died for all. He is the Savior of all. He loves all. Do you see the picture that is developing here in the everlasting gospel? It's a powerful picture when you think about it. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 tells us that God reconciled all. This is the message that we're to proclaim. This is the everlasting gospel that will decimate Babylon. Babylon is confusion not just about the gospel. Babylon is also confusion about prophecy. For that Understanding, We need to look in another book, the book of Daniel. If you want to open there to Daniel, we'll start with chapter 2. Daniel is an Old Testament minor prophet. If you go back to the book of Matthew and then start moving backwards from Matthew backwards into the Old Testament, Malachi and Zechariah and Zephaniah, you're going to come to Daniel, the book of Daniel. It's right, chalked right here between the book of Hosea and the book of Ezekiel. Daniel chapter 2. It's all about a dream. It's all about a man named Nebuchadnezzar. Some people call him the Nebster. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar was a heathen king. He was cruel. He was a tyrant. I'll give you an example. He had a dream. He couldn't remember it. He told all of his wise men, tell me the dream. And they said, we can't figure it out. And he said, well, you're dead then. You tell me my dream or you die. I mean, it's got to be worse than any CEO you've ever worked for. But God was the one who gave Nebuchadnezzar the dream. In fact, God brought an evangelist into Nebuchadnezzar's life. His name was Daniel, Daniel the Evangelist. It wasn't an easy assignment for Daniel. He had to go through some physical modifications, leave his family forever, not just for six weeks, didn't get to fly... <clears throat> upgrade on United Airlines, actually had to walk to Babylon, it was a long way, and he was only a teenager, so it was hard to say goodbye. I know when I enrolled my daughter at 14 into Academy this last year, it lasted about one month, and then we pulled her out and brought her home. It was hard to say goodbye, I know. When my son went to academy in his senior year, after being home for his sophomore and freshman and junior year, it was very hard. And he was a senior. <laughs> for Daniel, I don't know how hard it was. All I know was, was that he found faith and strength and courage in God. And he's in Babylon. And he's there for a purpose. And it's not about him. So he refuses all the luxuries of Babylon because he has a mission. And that mission that he purposes in his heart is that God's love will be revealed to this heathen king named Nebuchadnezzar who everyone fears except for Daniel. Because Daniel fears God. And when you fear God, there's no earthly fear that you can have. And so Daniel is there at the perfect time and place. Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. Can't remember it and obviously doesn't know what it means. All the wise men are going to die, and Daniel steps in. He says, give me some time, and I'll tell you the dream. And so Nebuchadnezzar says, oh, I'm desperate. I'll give you some time. Daniel goes into prayer. If you want to understand prophecy, you need prayer. The more you pray, the more understanding you're going to get. It's not reading of the words and checking out the different references and looking at the different commentaries that are going to figure out the prophecy. When you're on your knees, just thinking and praying, thinking and praying, and sometimes just being quiet before God, He's going to tell you. He's just going to tell you. That's what He did with Daniel. Daniel didn't have any books to, 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 to look to. He didn't have any scrolls to go check out. This dream was, was non-existent. It was not on the records. He could only get it from heaven. 
And that's exactly what happened. He went into this prayer meeting, and when he went in, he said, hey, guys, friends, we got to pray because all the wise men are being killed, and we don't want to be killed with the wise men. That's what he said in his prayer. He said, we need to pray. Daniel said, we need to pray because they're killing the wise men, and we... Verse 18, we need to desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning the secret that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. He goes in praying that he would not perish with the rest of the wise men. He comes out of that prayer meeting, not only having a better understanding of the dream, the vision, the prophecy, but also having a higher experience. What he says here is, verse 24, Therefore Daniel went in unto Arioch, whom the king had ordained to destroy the wise men of Babylon, and he went... He said and said unto them, Destroy not the wise men of Babylon. Wow. See, this isn't about us. This isn't about us getting knowledge and us being able to prove that we understand, therefore we can be saved. This is about us and them. The other people, the wise men, the ones that don't care about us. If the wise men had gotten the dream, they wouldn't have said, Hey, don't destroy Daniel and his friends. They would have said, Get rid of those guys. We're, we're smart enough. We can run the kingdom. We don't need that, those kids. But Daniel, when he connects with God, you and I, when we connect with God, we come out changed. We have a different attitude. Our attitude is concern for them, not just concern for us. We're going to talk about that more this afternoon when we get into marks and seals and why it is we keep the Sabbath the way that we do. Sabbath keeping is not just about us. It's about them. That's another sermon. So Daniel comes out with this heart burden for the wise men as well as for Nebuchadnezzar, and he tells Nebuchadnezzar the dream. Nebuchadnezzar was the first person to attend a Daniel seminar. He sat on the front seat where the angels sit. He listened to every word. And when the evangelist Daniel was done, he said, I want to join your church. I believe in your God. And so he was, he got membership immediately. All right, you're in. You're in. There were some problems that Nebuchadnezzar had later on, though. That happens sometimes. The net caches a lot of fish, a lot of things. And he struggled. And we could have given up on Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel could have said, well, you know, he wasn't ready. He's, uh, there's got to be some other fish in the sea. But he didn't. God didn't give up on Nebuchadnezzar. God kept working with Nebuchadnezzar and growing Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar, well, Nebuchadnezzar is going to be in the kingdom. We know that from his personal testimony in chapter 4. But before we get to chapter 4, we have to pass through chapter 3. And chapter 3 is what identifies Babylon in relation to Bible prophecy. And here's what we see in Daniel chapter 3. We see a man who took the truth of Bible prophecy, this image of gold and silver and brass and iron and iron mixed with miry clay that, that was going to be crushed by a stone out of the mountain without hands. He took that image and he changed it. It was still an image. There was still some truth there. But the truth was perverted. Nebuchadnezzar was afraid of that image because the head of gold represented Babylon and the silver represented another kingdom. And he didn't want another. He didn't want to come to an end. He didn't want to see his vision of the world change. He liked the way things looked from his perspective. He was afraid to trust God for the future. There are a lot of people out there today that are afraid to trust God for the future. There are a lot of religions out there today that are afraid to trust God for the future. There are people that believe they're going to be raptured out of here before everything ends and fails. They're afraid to trust God to bring them through this, this time of trouble that's, that's coming, that's going to be ahead of us. But Nebuchadnezzar, as afraid as he was, and Nebuchadnezzar, as much as he apostatized and and confused and became a part of this Babylonian confusion of prophecy, Nebuchadnezzar was saved in the end. There's a message here for us. There's a message here for us. God has people in Babylon. These people are honest at heart. They have genuine fears and genuine concerns and genuine questions about Bible prophecy, about what the Bible teaches, about who God is. And God is looking for Daniels today. People who are more concerned about others than they are about themselves. People who may be more concerned about themselves than they are about others, but they're willing to connect with God in such a way that God can change them and cause them to be more concerned about others than they are about themselves. 
any people who are willing to follow Jesus wherever he goes. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to have arrived. You don't have to, to be free from the temptations and the weaknesses that all of us have in the flesh. You don't have to pretend with God. Even Jesus said, God, I don't want to go to Calvary. I don't want to go to Gethsemane. I don't want to bear this cup. Even Jesus was honest with God. God can deal with that. It's when we pretend, Laodicea, when we pretend that everything is okay, that's when we're in trouble. But God can handle our realities. Surely He can. He loves us unconditionally. And only His love can change those realities into who He is and what He wants us to be. So there are people in Babylon... Look at it with me. There are people who are building upon the foundation. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11. There are people who are building upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11. The same way that Nebuchadnezzar was building. They're building wrong stuff. He had the foundation, but he built an image all of gold. He wanted Babylon to continue. He was afraid for the future. God got him straightened out. Daniel didn't give up on him. God didn't give up on him. There are people in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and I believe that Paul may be boring from the statue of Daniel. He may be boring from the language of the prophecies of Daniel. When he talks in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he says, For other foundation, verse 11, can no man lay that is laid, which is who? Jesus. Or we could say the everlasting gospel. There's no other foundation but the everlasting gospel. Now notice this, verse 12. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, and precious stones... That's the way the image comes. It's gold, it's silver, it's brass, it's iron. It has these different metals. Then he goes on to say wood, hay, and stubble. Paul here is differentiating between good and bad material. The good material is gold, silver, and precious stones. The bad material is wood, hay, and stubble. We know this because he's about to identify for us what's going to happen when the fire comes. When the fire comes, when the test and the trials of life come, verse 13, every man's work is manifest. For the day declares it because it shall be revealed by fire, and fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide he's, that, that he is built thereon, he shall receive a reward. So if you have Jesus as the foundation and you are building on that foundation gold and silver and precious stones, if you have the right theology and a right understanding of Bible prophecy and, and you understand the everlasting gospel, praise God. That's really, that's really, that's super. That's fantastic. Praise the Lord. But don't forget the other people because God loves them too. <laughs> and you're not better than them. They have a foundation. They may be building on that foundation wood, hay, and stubble, but hold on just a second. Notice what it says here. If any man's work shall be burned, wood, hay, and stubble, verse 15, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved. Yet as by fire. It's going to be a trial. I mean, when the church is not raptured, be with me now, when the church is not raptured and the seven last plagues come, and the Antichrist is set up, and everyone is still here. That's going to be a hard trial for some Christians. What are we going to be doing? I told you so. I hope not. <laughs> we are going to be doing whatever it is that Jesus would be doing at that time. I mean, look at his life. Jesus, when he was on this earth ministering, he went to talk to the Samaritans. Jesus wouldn't touch the Samaritans. He went to talk to the centurion. He went to the talk to the Syrophoenicians. He went to talk to the Greeks. He talked to everyone, the publicans, the sinners. Jesus even sought out the Pharisees. Shh. Don't tell anyone that. <laughs> he went everywhere seeking everyone. He didn't limit himself to some group or some people. Jesus was our example in all things. It's going to be difficult for them and for us. When our little pet doctrines and our little pet understandings of Scripture don't pan out. If we think that there is not a cherished opinion that we're going to have to give up, we are going to be sadly disappointed. And when those times happen, we just need to allow God to humble us. 
I mean, look at Daniel. Daniel's like this guy that is just incredible. I mean, he's just a man without fault. He's just blameless, and he's just writing out these prophecies. Boom, 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 boom. And all of a sudden, he comes to one, and he says, you know what? I don't get this. I just don't understand it. I just don't get it. <laughs> and God says, well, it's okay, Daniel. I've sealed that one up. <laughs> That's not for you to understand. But I want to understand all of it. Sorry. <laughs> Can you handle that? Can we handle that we don't have all the answers? Can we handle that only God is all wise and all knowing and all understanding? Can we trust ourselves with him? The message that God has for us in the fall of Babylon is a message of good news. Why? Because even though Nebuchadnezzar was afraid that this world was going to come to an end, it had to come to an end. This world is filled with greed and selfishness. You're reminded of that every time you fill up your gas tank. Wickedness, sex trafficking, mass murders, political war, political war, exploitation. It's got to come to an end. God wants to end it all. Why do we look at this world the way that we do? Well, maybe because we live in America. I don't know. Maybe we're oblivious to all this stuff. I'm so thankful now for all of the different ways that we can communicate with the rest of the world. Take a look out there and see what's happening. You need to see it because it will make you sick to your stomach and it will make you long for an end. It will make you long for the end, for the fall of Babylon. Read Revelation chapter 18 and understand what's taking place in the world today because it's all right there. The slaves and souls of men being bought and sold. It's all right there. Someone asked me about 10 years ago. They said, you know, I read that there's going to be slavery in the end of time. I don't see how there could be slavery in the end of time. Well, now we know how there could be slavery in the end of time. Right in our backyard. There's more sex slave traffic on I-5 than anywhere else. That's where I live, right on the I-5 freeway between California and Canada. It's sickening. It's heart sickening. And when I'm driving that freeway and I'm thinking about what's going on around me, I just don't even know how God handles it. God longs for the end to come, but it cannot come until everyone has had an opportunity to hear of his unconditional love for them individually. And that gospel has got to break through all of the confusion that Babylon is, that Babylon has brought to this world. It's got to help us to understand what it means in that context, what it means to fear God and give glory to Him. The hour of His judgment has come. What that means in the context of good news. And that's what we need to look at as we study this everlasting gospel message. It is not a message that primarily focuses on one denomination or one church it is a message that lifts up the gospel so that Babylon can be discerned and understood wherever it lies, wherever its slimy, dirty, filthy remains remain in the deep recesses of our own hearts. So the gospel can bring it to light and crush it out, crush out that slime of selfishness and make us new people in Jesus. 2 Corinthians just a few pages over from 1 Corinthians is where we'll close this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're tired, some of us. I've been preaching the gospel for 30 years now. I know I started when I was five years old. <laughs> we're older, we're worn. I'm, I'm, I'm officially now a member of AARP. Some of you can relate to that. Some of you don't have a clue what AARP is. If you don't, good for you. <laughs> Stay young. <laughs> we get weary. Our motivation lags. We wonder what's going to keep us going. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 what kept his go him going. He says in verse 14, For the love of Christ constrains us. The love of Christ constrains us. It motivates us. It pushes us on. 
There's nothing else. There's no news or information or intellectual understanding of anything that's going to motivate you like the love of Christ. And if your motivation is, is lagging, if you feel like you're losing motivation, you need to lay everything aside, everything that's in your life, everything that's surrounding you, everything, and you need to go back again and just fill yourself with the love of Jesus Christ. Don't listen to anything. Don't watch anything unless it's talking about the love of Jesus. And when you get filled with that love, then you need to just let God lead you to do this. Notice what it says. For the love of Christ constrains us because we thus judge, start judging this way, that if one died for all, then all died. That's what the New King James language says. All were dead, all died. What does that mean exactly? It means that when Jesus died on the cross, he didn't die for himself because he was innocent. He He died for you and for me. But he didn't just die for us. He's the Savior of all men. He died for everyone. Therefore, he has taken upon himself the sins of everyone. Therefore, everyone died in Jesus objectively. So when you look at a person now, you don't see that person in their sinful life because Jesus died for those sins. You see them in Jesus. You see Jesus dying for them. This is what it means in the context, verse 15, and that he died for all that they which live should not henceforth live for themselves, but for him which died for them and rose again. So now you're not living for yourself anymore. Notice what it says in verse 16. Wherefore, henceforth, we know no man after the flesh. Now we're going to stop right there. Because I'm going to let you study the rest of these verses on your own. But this is the kicker. Henceforth, from now on, we don't know anyone after the flesh. Now I know you after the flesh. You know me after the flesh. Let's just say. I know some of you better than others. My wife knows me better than any of you after the flesh. But she doesn't know me after the flesh. Because everything that she knows about me that is faulty and sinful and wrong, Jesus died to redeem. And so she doesn't see me after the flesh anymore. See, and that's what he means when verse 17 says, if any man's in Christ, he's a new creature. He sees things differently. He's not just new in the sense that, oh, I've been born again, I'm going to heaven. He's new in the sense that he sees other people differently. He has a whole new way of looking at people. He's motivated by the love of God. And that destroys Babylon. It's not just a proclamation, friends. It's an experience that God wants us to have. And there's only one way we can have this experience, today and every day. And that is by asking God to take over. Would you like to have that experience today? Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we're going to ask you right now to take over. To take our hearts, we can't give them, but they're your property. To save us in spite of ourselves, our weak and Christ-like selves. To mold us, to fashion us, to raise us into a pure and holy atmosphere. Father, you can do it.